ULA's Vulcan rocket ignites as the Methalox race heats up, Canada's fires are studied from space, and the James Webb Space Telescope opens a window into the early universe. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday, the 9th of June, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Sponsored by Brilliant. German aerospace company rocket factory Augsburg has completed a full-duration firing of their Helix engine. The test was conducted at the company's test site at the S-Range Space Center in Sweden and ran for 280 seconds. The Helix engine is the first privately developed staged combustion cycle engine in Europe and will power the company's RFA-1 rocket, nine engines on the first stage and one single vacuum-optimized engine on the upper stage. For this test, the Helix engine was also attached to a prototype RFA-1 second stage tank and systems, which also validated the rocket's upper stage performance in what the company calls an integrated system test. This puts Rocket Factory Augsburg just one step closer to launching Europe's first privately developed rocket into space and into orbit, but only if they can beat the rest. RFA is not alone. There are at least two more European private companies working on orbital rockets as we speak, so perhaps over the next few years we'll see quite a few more European launches popping up. This week we finally saw the results of the James Webb Space Telescope Advanced Deep Extragalactic Survey, or JADES. The name's a bit of a mouthful, but the data is really amazing. These results were presented as a part of this week's meeting of the American Astronomical Society, and they revealed how JWST has become a powerful tool to understand the early life of the universe. This image contains over 45,000 galaxies, all from an era when the universe was between 500 and 850 million years old. These galaxies are so far away that their light has been stretched over time due to the expansion of the universe, an effect that's called redshift. So this means that the light emitted by them has shifted wavelengths from the ultraviolet, or visible part of the spectrum, into infrared wavelengths, something that James Webb was precisely designed to look at. So if you've ever heard an ambulance drive past you before, you know how the pitch of the siren it seems to get higher as it approaches you and then lower as it drives away? Well, that's the Doppler effect. It's basically that effect that's happening with the light from those galaxies, except instead of sound waves being stretched, it's light waves. The further away a galaxy is, the more redshifted its light is. Using Webb's different filters and instruments, scientists have been able to measure the redshift of thousands of galaxies at once, with hundreds of these galaxies now found at record-breaking redshifts and therefore distances. This new data has also allowed scientists to understand the rate of star formation in the early universe, as well as to study the complex structures that formed within galaxies during that era. This data suggests that these early galaxies had a really high rate of star formation and already hosted complex structures within them just like we see today, an indication that galaxy evolution perhaps occurred much faster than previously thought. The James Webb Space Telescope has been in operation for almost a year, and it's already rewriting entire books on astronomy and space science. So here's to many more years of incredible data from this mighty telescope. By now you've probably heard about Canada's raging wildfires that are sadly burning thousands of hectares of land. This week, entire portions of southeast Canada and the northeast of the United States were covered in a hazy orange cloud as a result of the smoke of these fires. I actually witnessed the brunt of it firsthand here in New York City. These are some unedited photos that I took during the worst of it. And let me tell you, it felt like something out of a science fiction movie. The sky literally looked like we were on Mars. But the scope and the damage of these fires can be seen even more broadly from space. Multiple satellites from different agencies and companies have been retasked in the last few weeks to study these fires to better help combat them. In this picture from the Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer, or MODIS, on NASA's Aqua satellite, we can see the smoke from the fires in Quebec as seen on June 3rd. While these fires are expected to occur around this time of year, they have already expanded to over 160,000 hectares of land. All this at a time when, in a more average year, only about 247 hectares would have burned. In this other picture, captured by NOAA's GO-16 satellite, we can see how the smoke from those fires accumulated and drifted south into the northern parts of the United States, covering hundreds of kilometers of land and raising the levels of fine particulate matter in the air to record-breaking numbers. Planet also released two images this week comparing the presence of smoke on New York City as seen from space. 
These, and other images and data captured from space, are helping scientists to also understand how the particulates in the atmosphere travel over long distances. Different layers of air move in different directions, and thus, depending on their size, some particles may be in one layer or another up in the atmosphere. This means that different parts of the atmosphere can have different amounts of smoke depending on your location, which is important to know to be able to predict hazardous health conditions. This is yet another example of how helpful and important it can be to study our own planet from space in order to protect each other. Stay safe out there. Up next, we'll be looking at the launches that happened this week. But first, Sawyer has a word from today's sponsor. Thanks, Alicia. This video is sponsored by... Oh, who am I kidding? I don't need a script for this one because today's sponsor is one of my absolute favorites, Brilliant. I know you've heard me talk about Brilliant.org before, but that's because I really like it and it definitely helps me learn. Math is not my strong suit. And yet, I've been trying some of the math lessons and they're actually making it really easy to understand. Now, normally this is where I would share one of Brilliant's thousands of lessons that relate to this video, but I'm gonna switch it up and actually just share one that I found really interesting. There's a whole course on search engines. Now, did you know that a computer can read through the entire Bible in just one second to help you try and find a word that you searched for in it? Specifically in that course, there's even lessons on indexing. I won't spoil any more of it. You'll have to try it out for yourself which you can do by visiting brilliant.org slash NASA spaceflight or clicking the link in the description below. And if you do, you'll get a 30 day free trial. The first 200 of you will also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. I'm gonna go back to my lessons. Uh, Alicia, I'll send it over to you for more space news. Thanks Sawyer. Hey, that reminds me of a joke. Where does Google go for happy hour? The search bar. Now let's look at this week in launches. Yep, you guessed it. It's another Starlink mission, specifically Group 6 Mission 4. This Falcon 9 lifted off on June 4th at 1220 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida, carrying another batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage, B-1078, was flying for a third time and successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. This launch brought 22 more Starlink satellites to space bringing the total launched to 4,543, although only 3,541 are in operational orbit. Another Falcon 9 lifted off this week, carrying the CRS-28 cargo mission to the International Space Station. Liftoff took place on June 5th at 1547 UTC from Launch Complex 39A in Florida. The first stage, B-1077, was flying for a fifth time and landed successfully on the drone ship A Short Fall of Gravitas. This was also the third launch by SpaceX, featuring the short MVAC nozzle extension on the upper stage. Dragon completed an 18-hour rendezvous and docked to the Zenith docking port of the ISS Harmony module the next day at 9.54 UTC. The spacecraft carried 3,304 kilograms of payload on board, including a new pair of ISS rollout solar arrays, or IROSAs, that will be installed on the ISS in the next few days. We're heading east to China with Cast Space's second ever flight of the Laishan 1 rocket. It departed Site 130 at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center just after 4 o'clock Universal Time on Wednesday. Inside the payload fairing were 26 satellites, which ended up in a sun synchronous orbit. Two of these are Xi'an 24 A and B, which are experimental satellites for the Chinese government. Unfortunately, that's all we've been told about this mission so far. Sticking to Zhiquan, this Kuaizhou 1A launched at approximately 2.35 UTC on the day of this episode's release, Friday the 9th, carrying the Longzheng 3 prototype communication satellite to a sun-synchronous orbit. This week we had great news coming for three Methylox rockets which are marching toward either their first or their next spaceflight. Vulcan finally performed its flight readiness firing this week after several delays due to issues with engine igniters, something that we covered on last week's episode. With a fix in place, ULA rolled the rocket out to the pad on June 6th and proceeded to test the igniters before loading propellant onto the vehicle, thus ensuring they worked ahead of the start of the countdown. Another milestone achieved ahead of the static fire was a recycle test. During a recycle test, the clock counts down to a simulated T0 and then it's held seconds away from engine ignition. A simulated abort is called and then the count moves back to the T-7 minutes and holding mark on Vulcan's countdown. After a three-hour delay due to weather, 
ULA finally resumed the count and went ahead with the firing of Vulcan's two BE-4 engines on June the 8th at 1.05 UTC. ULA confirmed later on Twitter that the test ran for the expected duration and that the company would now begin preparations for Vulcan's first flight. This will also involve the completion of the investigation into a Centaur 5 test stand anomaly that occurred earlier this year. We'll have to stay tuned to their socials to find out when they're ready for launch, but you can bet NSF will be here to bring it to you live as it happens. The other Methalox rocket with good news this week is from the other side of the world. Our good friend Harry Stranger was able to capture from satellite pictures Landspace's Zuke-2 rocket out on the pad in China. Landspace is planning to launch the second flight of this rocket in just a few days, and last time it came very close to reaching orbit. A failure on the second stage Vernier engines caused the rocket to not have the velocity to reach orbit. But hopefully Landspace has solved this issue and might be able to win the race for the first Methalox rocket to orbit. And much closer to our robots, we have good news for Starship as well. And while this is not a Starbase update, it is a spoiler for next week's episode. This week, we have finally seen road closures posted on Cameron County's website for next week. These are potentially related to static fire testing of Ship 25, the upper stage and ship to be used on Starship's second flight. Of course, SpaceX will also need to complete work on the orbital launch mount's repairs and upgrades before testing Booster 9, the first stage to be used on that flight. Hopefully, in a matter of months, we might see all three of these rockets successfully launching into space and completing their inaugural missions. Firefly Aerospace, the neon green SmallSat launching machine, has acquired Spaceflight Inc. in a move that has surprised a great deal of the spaceflight community. Spaceflight Inc. is a space company whose main work up until this point has been to integrate satellites onto different kinds of rockets, arranging flights for their customers, essentially acting as the middleman between manufacturing and launching. They've most recently developed and flown orbital transfer vehicles, or space tugs, these not only host customer satellites, but also power them and transfer them to their desired orbital destinations. Firefly claims that this acquisition will allow the company to combine these capabilities with their launch services for full end-to-end -end service to the customer. These capabilities will also be added on top of the development of Firefly's medium launch vehicle, the Space Utility Vehicle, and the Blue Ghost Lunar Lander programs. Under the new ownership, Spaceflight Inc. will carry out all of its remaining contracts on rockets from other companies, but new customers will exclusively use Firefly's Alpha and future medium launch vehicle rockets. This week, we also saw the return of the Shenzhou 15 crew down to Earth. The mission was launched on November 29, 2022, carrying Taikonauts Fei Jun Long, Den King Ming, and Zhang Lu. They've spent a little bit over six months on board the Chinese space station, conducting four spacewalks to upgrade the station and deploy satellites as well. With the launch of Shenzhou 16 last week, the Shenzhou 15 crew handed over the command of the station to the new crew and departed the orbital complex. Undocking from the station's forward docking port occurred on June 3rd at 1329 UTC. Several orbits later, Shenzhou 15 jettisoned its orbital module and started its deorbit burn for an entry back on Earth. Landing of the spacecraft's descent module occurred in the Gobi Desert at 2233 UTC later that day. Now let's have a look at next week in spaceflight. Next week we'll have a pair of EVAs on the ISS to install the iROSAs delivered by the CRS-28 mission. The first spacewalk is scheduled for June 9th and it's set to start at 1315 UTC. The second spacewalk is scheduled for June 15th and is set to start at 1320 UTC. Next week, we'll also have back-to-back -back Falcon 9 launches on June 12th. First, we'll have the Starlink Group 511 mission from Florida with a roughly three-hour launch window containing several launch opportunities. The first launch opportunity is set for 710 UTC. NSF will be there live streaming the launch as always. Later in the day, we'll have the Transporter 8 mission from Vandenberg with a one-hour, 43-minute long window that opens at 2114 UTC. The first stage will be landing back on land, so if you're in the area, keep an ear out for those sonic booms. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Remember to go to brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight or click on the link in the description for a 30-day free trial. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.